This is Improving Your Creative Outputs. Welcome. Um, my name is John Heimbuck. I'm the moderator for this panel. Um, I'd love to just go down the line and uh, get the introductions about what pe who people are and why they're sitting on this panel. If you would give your name, pronouns, and background, that'd be great. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Daniel Kuss. I, uh, for about five or six years now, I've been running an event in New York where we improvise a board game in two hours. Um, I'm also the author of uh, PromptSpitter.com, where you can generate uh, different creative prompts uh, to work from. Hi, my name is Shauna Ora Knight. I am a vendor down the, in the dealer's hall, and I have shiny artwork <laughs> and jewelry. Um, I'm also an author of Smut <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and leadership, right. leadership and Facilitation Skills, for, especially for pagan groups, um, you know, dealing with abusers in your groups, uh, all that exciting, fun, happy group dynamics, cheerful stuff. And uh, so I am, you know, I'm, I'm constantly doing the, the creative things because the, this is I do this full time. And uh, so I love to nerd on creative process. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be here. My name is John Heimbach. Uh, my pronouns are he and they. Uh, I am the uh, artistic director of Walking Shadow Theatre Company in Minneapolis. I'm a playwright as well as a filmmaker and a storyteller. Um, I'm Janelle, and um, I sound like this because this weekend has taken it out of me. <laughs> but I'm still dressed and cosplaying because to the end, baby. Yeah. To the end of God, I will be going hard and then I will sleep for eternity. Um, so I'm an actor and performer in the Twin Cities and all around wherever it will take me. Um, I do everything you can think of improv, TV, film, commercial, voiceover, singing, dancing. I'm a dancing monkey, whatever you call it. I'll do whatever. Um, so. What else were they That's it. That's it? Cool, that's me. Um, happy to be here. I'm Dave Walbridge, uh, he, him. I do two things creatively, write books and perform. Um, and I think a lot about creativity and have a lot to say on the topic. So when you are entering into a creative project, uh, <coughs> or just beginning in the, in the early phases of that project, what, what is your, how would you define your process for undertaking the creation of a thing? It's kind of a broad question, but I feel like I want to know people's process before we talk about the hacks. <laughs> I'll go. Um, when I write a book, usually I get all the other books about the same topic and read them. So I'll get 12 or 14 books on body language and see what's out there in the world. And that inspires me to say, what does the world already know about the topic and what needs to be said? You don't have to have an answer. <laughs> okay, you don't. That's okay. I can, I can quickly say, um, in, in, the, in the group that I run, basically we start by coming up with the prompt in the first, uh, we, we have a whole, kind of a whole process that we follow, where basically we, in the first 15 minutes we conceptualize, we have like a few things that we need to nail down to get things started, you know, make sure that we're not starting with a completely blank piece of paper. Um, and then, you know, from there, force, you know, tiny iterations on top of that uh, uh, initial prompt. So uh, basically the idea is to, you know, um, start with, not start with nothing, and also uh, not kind of fall into constant uh, re-capitulation um, over like, oh, well, what if we're this, what if we're that, kind of forced decisions to kind of push yourself forward. And that's another thing I think you often will fall into is um, getting stuck in, in you know, uh, decision making. Uh, so my creative process is very different depending on what I'm creating. For these these texture paintings, these are this, these are easy for me. They, I mean, I have them in my head. I can see the entire piece in my head as soon as I find the frame at a thrift store often. And it's more of a matter of getting through, getting enough paintings done that you know are already on my list. And then sometimes I, you know, I sometimes I have commissions and commissions are make my brain not want to do them. And then so you know, I'll be like, but I'm gonna paint a froggy because that's fun. And so you know, the, the, those kinds of paintings are very. You know, I see them, and it's just a matter of having the time to do them. Uh, writing is an entirely different thing. Of, you know, like you said, uh, you know, if I'm doing nonfiction, 
um, I will let that be. If I'm doing nonfiction, I will you know pick up some other books on the topic and uh, you know try to do the same thing, see what you know what what information is out there that I can cite as a resource that like go over here, and what is something I can add to it. Um, you know, fiction. My fiction process is, you know, I have to get more, I have to get into kind of an obsessive headspace where I'm just writing. Um, I have to craft a very specific playlist to keep myself in the zone, and I have to really eliminate a lot of the other distractions. I, I don't switch back and forth between these processes very well. I have to be in the tunnel for one of them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's often getting into the right tunnel. Um, writing takes a lot more tunnel prep uh, for me than the than the, the texture paintings. Those are they're easy shiny dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll piggyback on that and say that, you know, for me, I would say that I do two types of creation. I do interpretive and generative. Um, and so say directing a play uh, or interpreting as a performer someone else's work is interpretive in nature. So uh, that work just tends to be reading the text a lot and getting ideas and seeing what sparks in my brain and making notes about that and then following those notes and through research paths and through discovery and visualization. Um, for the more generative work, which is basically writing for me, um, I would say that follows much more uh, hyper-focus. Like, I just can't... Uh, I have found that I'm the sort of person who needs to be in the headspace of the work. And so what I do in order to get in the headspace of the work is reading a lot about the subject, whether it's original, like works that are in the genre or whether it's historical research or contextual research. And then I try to find um, just sort of a central metaphor for my own self about what I wanna, what I wanna explore. It might not be part of the genre at all, but like why this genre, why these tools? And um, then as I'm doing that, uh, usually something emerges from that. Uh, but it's a lot of writing that I throw away at the beginning. Um, I thought of some stuff now. Sweet! <laughs> also, yeah, I'm always going to say this, but anybody in the back, um, there are seats and some available here if you guys want to try to sit. Uh, it's down at all, up to you. But just know that we all get cozy. Uh, so I would like, like to say that so no one feels uncomfortable to come find a seat. No, good call. It's day four. We all know each other. Now. Yeah. <laughs> and the theme of my panels are that I'm always uh, the opposite of what almost everybody else is, and I'm not a writer at all. Cool. <laughs> um, so for my creative process, I I don't write in a journal. I I respect it, but I'm just I'm, that is not the medium for me that comes out. Uh, maybe someday, I think someday, but right now it's not. So whenever I feel like I want to be creative and I, I'm trying to get smart, I do a lot of dance, uh, so expressing myself like physically is usually how I feel that way. Um, if you don't have any interest in dance, then that's obviously not going to help you, but I just find that like sometimes freeing motion and like walking, exercising, just kind of like moving around, obviously it's the, the brain flowing and the blood pumping and then things usually come out. But um, I do a lot of social media content and like I try to do a lot of like Instagram reels, TikToks, things like that. And I find that it's sometimes tough to to be like, oh, what should I do next? What do I post? How do I, you know? And I'm like, I don't want to just do things to do things. I like to have them have meaning. And I find that most of the time, when creativity strikes, you just need to like go for it. Whatever time of the day that is. Okay, mm -hmm. listen. I went to the Taylor Swift concert, and she has an album called Midnight's. And it was all songs that she wrote at midnight around that time because sometimes that's when the creativity comes out, and you gotta let it uh, let it out. So I always say like, for me, like don't. Don't say like, I'm time to be creative now for this hour block from 1 to 2 p.m. Like, you just kind of got to let it hit when it hits or write it down like an idea you have or something like that so you can flush it out. Um, that's usually what I end up doing when I'm creative and then uh, it feels really good to just kind of like flow through. Yeah. Um, can people talk about a uh, time in which their creative process, they found themselves stuck or blocked or otherwise frustrated and what you did to get through that process? I find that you have to trust in yourself and whatever tools or processes you have because there's nothing harder than knowing that something's due six weeks from now and you have no energy or idea. You just have to sit down and say, people have done this before, I've done this before, let me start down the paths that are frequently fruitful and see what happens. You know, having something like the prompts or a structure is supremely helpful. In improvisation, all of the games are basically structures so that you can then jump off. Um, the hardest thing is an empty page, an empty stage, 
uh, with nothing. So give yourself something and work from there. Um, mine's pretty quick. Um, sleep on it. Okay. I uh, did anybody see me masquerade last night? Did I become masquerade? I was Megan, the AI murder doll. So I had a dan I did a dance to that because like, I guess I like to dance. But it took me a while to actually think of that, and you get frustrated because I, you know, I'm choreographing. I'm like, I hate this, I hate this. But or you can't remember things. But you sleep on it, and the next day you're like, oh, I remember this a little better than I thought. I found that to be one of the best things for me. Um, if you are blocked, just Give it a night, wake up the next day, usually, usually something will come out or you will remember whatever you were wanting to do uh, even better. I'll, yeah, I'll second that and say even just like walking away out of the room and, coming, and going for a walk and coming back, you can, you, you're, you know, your brain just sort of unconsciously is like in the background, right? And, uh, and, and you come back and you're like, oh yeah, now I know what to do. Uh, so even, even that uh, is, is, is helpful. So I'm going to come at this from the ADHD, autism, PTSD, anxiety, chronic pain, chronic fatigue perspective, which is my, very, my Venn diagram. Um, and also if you're familiar with pathological de demand avoidance, which also is a part of the, the you know, package. So I get a commission and instantly I hate it and I don't want to do it. <laughs> um, I started getting better at saying no to commissions because I'm, I'm terrible. Like I, uh, my first convergence in 2019 as a vendor, I had someone commission me for this. Uh, I mean, it, it turned out really awesome, but I hated every minute of doing it. Um, or at least it, my clients started bugging me and that of course makes me not want to do it. Anybody else have, have that fun? Have, yeah. So. <laughs> There was a certain point where, I mean, and his emails, like, I would, it would literally give me an anxiety attack when he would say, hey, you know, how's the pain going? And I'm looking at the blank canvases. I'm like, it's going, it's going great, man. I'm, uh, you know, working on it. Uh, so in, situ in dire situations like that, like, I'm giving you my worst case, like, I just want to set fire to the canvas and, and, you know, disappear and change my name. <laughs> uh, I trick myself as an executive function hack. Is um, I'm just going to do the border work. I'm just I'm just going to paint the Celtic knotwork border because I can paint Celtic knotwork when I'm tired. When I can paint it backwards. I can paint it forwards. I'm just going to start the border work. And then, okay, I want to get the I want to get the dragon laid out. So I kind of trick myself into doing one of the simpler pieces and then I can kind of get get into it and get out of because the, the border work is that that is I, I will be honest the whole thing, painting these is what got me through uh, a breakup with an abusive ex and uh, painting helped me get my brain right so this helps me the, the border work stuff I find a thing that reduces my anxiety and then I can kind of slide over into the thing that was giving me more anxiety because now I'm in the zone. So finding something to get myself in the zone, also letting myself do the work when my brain wants to do the work, which is at night. Um, you know, so I have to I have to do stuff like that. Like if I if I need to get into the zone, I need to set up so that I don't have appointments the next day. I don't need to be awake during day star hours. I can just get into the group and stay there. Some of the best advice I got for writing, for playwriting specifically, but really it's for any writing, is to just do the first draft badly. Not like let yourself do the first draft badly, but like intentionally do the first draft badly. Make it really bad. Make it as terrible as you can imagine it being. Um, and uh, but still write the scene. You know, still do the work. And it, it actually is really helpful to give yourself permission. I find it's actually hard to stay in the headspace of writing badly. Like you have to keep reminding yourself to it's like it's like you off. start making it good, yeah. and then it's like, oh no, oh no, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have uh, I found a Ernest Hemingway uh, quote that is right along the same lines. He said, "The first draft of anything is horrible." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually the quote I found was a different word. <laughs> so the quote was, the first draft of anything is horrible from Ernest Hemingway. Yeah. I mean, I just want to just wanna piggyback, piggyback up one thing Shama said. Um, this has been a struggle for me, and I've noticed that I read, I, so I do read, don't worry you guys, I do read. <laughs> Not even if I don't write. I read a lot, a lot, a lot of books about acting, and you know, just ways to get the business, anyway, all that kind of stuff. But one of the hardest things for me, and one of the best things I learned, and I think this is kind of what Shama was getting at, is making good habits. And um, because a lot of times, 
you are just stopping yourself because you're giving reasons why you shouldn't do it yet or whatever. And I noticed that when you want to be creative, but you are overwhelmed by your, yes, the blank canvas, um, m making the small changes are what matters. It's like it's like if someone's saying, I want to start exercising, I want to start being, I want to start being active, and you're like, it's so hard to motivate me. Like I don't want to get all this on and go to the gym. So then the small habits are, well, I'm just going to move my shoes to the. That's it. I'm just going to move my shoes to the door. Well, I guess they're at the door. I mean, I'll. I'll put them on. I, I gotta, I gotta go in the yard and do this or something like that. Well, I mean, now I'm outside, so I was like, you just, you just do a little small thing, tiny minuscule thing, and I found that to be really helpful because once you make that small habit, it just keeps growing. So with your creative work, um, I feel like, like you said, just do the border. Oh, I know. I'm bored. Well, okay, you know, it keeps going. So I, I think just try to find those really small, small things. That's like, I'm gonna make my bed today. All I know is those those little chip, little habits really help me because I get very overwhelmed by the stress of all the things I'm trying to do. So, anyway. You know, actually, that, that brings up an interesting question or an interesting point. It makes me I think sound, about. I sound terrible. Um, where where do you do your creative work? How do you set yourself up for your creative work? Do you work best at home? Do you work best in other places? What are the traps that you fall into? I know for myself, if I try working at home, sometimes. If I'm really in the groove, I can do it. But if I'm not, then I'll find myself drifting towards the dishes or drifting towards the chores. So I have to really get out of the house to do a lot of my work, which makes the pandemic very hard for my creative output. Other people? Uh, my living room is the art studio. And uh, my, when my partner and I moved in together, we moved in together at the, toward the beginning of the pandemic. We had already planned on moving in together, and, and you know, it was, a, it was definitely a good move, but we had to move everything ourselves. But when we were apartment hunting, we specifically, uh, we, we don't sleep well together. We both have entirely different sleep needs. And um, so we needed a three bedroom so that we could have their bedroom, my bedroom, and then they could have their little gaming cubby in the smallest bedroom. And then we don't really have a living room, we have the art pile. Mm -hmm. If you've seen my booth in the vendor hall, it looks like that, except nothing's done. <laughs> <laughs> and everything's just stacked. Um, so yeah, my, my living room, I, I basically, I have, um, I, 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 it's all like executive function hacks for me. If I have to go somewhere to do things, that's like this big, hurdle to get there, so I minimize that. If I have to walk down or upstairs to get a better angle, if I have to walk down or upstairs uh, to, to go create, that's another hurdle. So I just try and make everything as easy as possible um, you know, for myself and remove as many barriers because, yeah, we, leaving, like even leaving to go to the grocery store, I'm like, oh my god, it takes me days. Like, okay, really, I'm out of food. I really got to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just I try and, and remove as many obstacles as possible um, so that I can get things done. Um, yeah, I I'm with uh, John here. I cannot be at home. Um, I I can if it hits, I'll and I'll do it at home. But otherwise, I'm easily distracted. Home has too many things. I can watch something. I can read something. I can do anything else at my house. So I'm usually like trying to go out and be somewhere else. I like to, I'll take a class or I'll. Anything that is forcing me basically to do the thing that I'm trying to do. So um, yeah, I'm not much of like when I was in college, I had to if I had to write a big paper, I had to go into the library and seclude myself in a box and look and look at nobody. I can't have music on, like all that. Music is on. Your girl's gonna start dancing, <laughs> and that's not what she's there to do. So anyway, yeah, I'm I'm definitely someone who has to leave uh, the things that are familiar to me. Kind of just really force myself to do it. Um, which isn't always probably the best method for a lot of people, but if, it, if you haven't found something that works for you, try that. If that you find yourself being distracted easily, uh, like me, try to put yourself in a really, really secluded situation. Yeah, um, one of the things is you need to create space in your life, both physically and emotionally. Uh, if you want to be more creative, I've got a hack for you. Unplug your TV. Because What's now, you, you yeah, <laughs> that's impossible. Um, if you unplug your TV, when you go to plug it in, your brain will go, do you want to watch TV? As opposed to, mine goes on automatically as I walk through the room, apparently. Uh, because there are things, I have no video games on any of my computers. Because do I want dopamine? Or a client project? Well, we all know the answer to that. You're so, powerful, I can't do that. Yeah, years of practice.
So make space. Um, if you have a writing studio, art studio, dance studio, that's lovely. If you don't have a living room, that's lovely. But it also feels really good when you go, I have a dance studio. Now maybe four feet, but it's your dance studio. So. On the other hand though, I do think that taking inputs is important, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't just have your, you know, never consume other things to have. Because like, you know, I mean, even, I mean, maybe TV is not, like I, I get the, the sentiment of like, you don't want to watch like reality TV for, for 12 hours every day, right? That's not particularly, it's, it's, you know, it's like, just like food, it's like what you consume is like, you know, um, important. But, <laughs> yeah. but, yeah. Uh, but also like, you know, I, I believe that, you know, you know, creativity is a little bit of a pipeline and the, and the inputs are the start of it, right? You know, what, what you take in is kind of, uh, ultimately derives what comes out, and so, uh, you know, uh, you might find that when you're stuck, like, you know, watching a bunch of Stanley Cooper movies might, you know. It might be your, your unsticking point, yeah. for sure. <coughs> yeah, and I'll take the, the TV thing I agree with personally, um, at least that's what works for me. I can't watch TV, I can't. No, um, no, no, no. Yeah, I can't listen to music that has, um, I can listen to music with lyrics, but I can't listen to music that has narrative forward. So musicals are out, comedy music is out, podcasts are out, I can't do any of those things. But I can do uh, a lot of Taylor Swift, so I find myself... I knew that. it! <laughs> <laughs> I knew it! See, that would never work, I need music um, without words. Yeah, no, and I, that's, you know, rock music and alternative has always been fine for me, and I can just write to it, and that's not a problem. But my spouse, for example, um, is a quilter, and as a crafter, uh, she keeps her hands busy, and she doesn't need her mind is actively engaged. So she watches tons of TV, and by watches, I mean mostly listens to, but um, but it's constantly going in her workspace, um, which means that we can't work in the same room, which is fine. <laughs> uh, yellow. Um, going off of unplugging the TV, my biggest new thing is uh, my phone has uh, like sleep mode so that it, yes. you avoid it, but you can turn that on if you're trying to create it. It goes mm -hmm. black and white and it will silence everything. Yeah, so I've heard, like this, answer, right? I've heard of this hack of turning your phone and the accessibility to black and white uh, instead of just turning the color off. And it reduces the amount of dopamine you get from looking at sites, especially image-based sites, you're kind of like, meh. <laughs> um, I personally subscribe to a, a service called Freedom, which will block the internet on a great number of your, uh, it'll, it'll coordinate with all your devices and block the internet. Um, it's actually really great, uh, and you can set an amount of time for it. Yeah, I, I binge watch TV while I'm it, when I, but only while doing like this this kind of painting. Um, with writing, it's again it's like it's often a specific playlist, but I usually will end up just playing one song on repeat, which is generally when I go to headphones so I don't drive my partner insane. Yeah. Um, so good quality headphones. Um, I used to have Sennheisers, now I have Koss, and uh, you know get the ear cover, you know. Get in the in the zone, and when I if I'm editing, it's if there's one song, and it, and it has to be almost inaudible, but just enough to keep me in the heads because I edit, editing makes me want to just scream. So, but I need to with editing, I actually need to go back and forth to get the do, the like Facebook dopamine. Mm -hmm. So I'll edit for you know 20 minutes, an hour, and then and then flip over. I'm like, okay, I need a break here editing for a minute. Is hard. Yeah. I got. I, I go back and forth, and I'm like, okay, I can do another, 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 another chapter here, and um, so yeah, I go. It, it really depends on what I'm creating. There are very specific stimuli I need, or, or you know, silence or close to it. Uh, orange back there. How do you discover that inaudible music helps you stay on track <laughs> with editing, or that one song on repeat is good <laughs> for writing? Or that's, whatever your particular trick is. You guys yeah, have all a, talked about your tricks. How do you know? So the question is, how do you know what your tricks are? How do you discover that that weird little thing is the thing you need? Um, we all have the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's part of the fun. It's called, it's called failing. It's called learning and failing. Yep. Maybe it's a coffee shop. Maybe it isn't. Yeah. Maybe it's upstairs. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's a laptop. Maybe it isn't. It's kind of and, tribal. At the end of a couple of weeks, you're exhausted and you go, well, apparently it's under my bed. <laughs> but it's different for everybody. And keep in mind, there's times, there's places, there's moods. Um, we were talking a lot about being in the tunnel 
sometimes to write, you have to be in a very specific headspace. For me, that means nobody may talk to me. I wanted to make a sign for my house that says, you may interrupt me, but it costs us money. <laughs> so the kids would go, mm, I like money, I like eating. Yeah. It's trial and error, I think that's all I can say too. I just figured out, it's tried stuff, seen it work. Played music for a while, I was like, nope, not getting anything done. Oh, I can listen to film scores, let's do that for a while. And that didn't work, it's just, it's just trial and error. I think for me, I, yeah, it is trial and error. I found the, um, mostly it's when I, I become aware when things don't work rather than when I become aware that things do work. And so it's been mostly a process of elimination. So, nope, can't write to that, can't do that, have to be somewhere, have to, and sometimes, um, sometimes I can do it under every circumstance. Sometimes I can sit in the lobby downstairs here and ignore everyone at work, but sometimes that just does not fly. I would agree with the trial and error. Um, I'm always trying things. I um, as, a, as a side gig, I do for, you know, because being an author and artist, you know, not, not always as lucrative as one might, might want. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a billionaire. Right? Uh, <laughs> so I do decluttering and organizing because apparently fitting all of that, all of my artwork and displays into my van means I'm really good at organizing people's houses. <laughs> um, and almost all of my clients are neurodivergent people with some form of physical disability who are just super embarrassed that they can't get everything done. And so I'm constantly working on executive function hacks for them to help them simplify things. And that's what I do for myself. So I, like, I, like you said, you know, I, when, I know when it's not working, but because I'm always kind of meta-processing stuff like this, I, you know, when it is working, I keep note of that. I'm like, oh, I just listened to this one song and I wrote for six hours. And you know, the one night I wrote 22,000 words. Wow. I mean, it was a lot. There was caffeine involved, uh, and, and when I say caffeine, I don't really drink coffee a whole lot because the way I like coffee is not, I like it with all the sugar and, and, I, and dairy and I can't, and, you know, I have food issues. I had coffee because I went on a date that it was not a great date, and I, so I was very caffeinated and I started writing, and then the day star rose, I was holy shit, shit. I wrote a lot. <laughs> Let me jump off that. Um, there's a lot of myth in the creative world that certain chemicals will help you. They are all fake. Um, people who are drunk writers are not good writers, uh, and that's a, a myth that we have to overcome. Most of the hard work is physical work, even if you're sitting in a chair for 22 hours. Um, and be wary of these stories you hear about people who uh, drank themselves to death, um, because they did. It doesn't help the creativity. Caffeine might be the exception. Uh, if, if I may offer uh, a little bit of a crackpot theory that may give you a little bit more of a heuristic than just try everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, something that I've noticed that seems to be generally the case is everyone has their own baseline for how much stimulation they can tolerate yeah. regularly. Like for me, I could be listening to music at all times and be happy with that. Like I live in New York City and like I don't even notice it, but I have friends who can't stand it. It's just like way too much. And so I think like knowing where that is for you kind of will help you just prioritize what to try. Cause like people who have higher stimulation like levels will probably need to be listening to music or have those sorts of things that kind of help them focus, whereas like people who are a little bit on the lower end of the spectrum are going to be more quiet and lack, lack of interruption and that kind of thing. So that kind of can maybe help the guy like what to try first. Green. Yeah. Uh, why, you know, to the panel, uh, why do you think that creativity is so easily distracted? Because it's usually not a fine line, like if you're an engineer or something, you just follow the formula. That's it, it's just because it's too broad. It's too broad, at least for me. That's uh, I, I am an engineer, and that's oh. actually not how it works. Okay, <laughs> you know what? I, you know what, I shouldn't say that my dad's an engineer. He would have been like, you kid. Yeah. You're right, you're right. That is a process, I should know that. Um, oh, math. Okay, math is a formula. I, math is art. Dang it! Okay, how about walking in a straight line? Um, Check it out. My so, dad's walking in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. Oh, 
Um, so why do you think that creativity is so easily distracted? <laughs> oh! Distracted! <laughs> We are all fairly distractible people. Um, my my feeling is Sorry. that I think you're right. Maybe maybe you're not, David. But uh, I think I think all the rest of us probably deal with some degree of hyper focus need, and that moving into a space of creativity is one that feels tenuous in and of itself. And so staying in that headspace is a thing that has to be fought for or, or maintained. And um, and you know when you're not doing it. You might not know immediately when you're not doing it, but you realize like three hours later, oh shit, I haven't been doing it. The answer to your question is because creativity is play. You're, you will dance into the kitchen, and then you will have a snack, and only part of that is creative. And then you will dance into the living room, and you might write, and you might look at birds. Both of those are creative, one of those is useful. <laughs> so you're in this space of, of this joyfulness and this happiness and discovery, and you wander off a lot. Yeah, at the oh, sorry. Yeah, at the core of the creative process is this like divergent thinking that's kind of hard to sort of. Well, like like I've gone through this myself, where like I thought, oh, I this is a this is a stallion that I can tame and I can control, and then and then it rebels against you because you're not actually feeding it sort of the divergence and the the multiplicity that it requires, right? And so. You know, it's just something that can only sort of be gently, you know, held like a butterfly, right? So, like, like um, because it's so, you know, uncontrollable and so, like, you know, like this, but I want to connect this and I want to connect that and I want to connect this and connect this, right? Like, um, I think that, that, that nature is why we all so crave, like, that focus time where it can be like, well, I'm just going to give it... You know, the best way to avoid temptation is to is to not have that at all. So just cut cut everything out so you can be like, all right, now I've got you. You can only create within this space. Don't go into the kitchen. We need to do something right now. Well, I think, uh, so bihemispheric thinking has sort of been debunked a bit, um, but this notion of left brain and right brain in, um, it, the concept, though, in kind of a, a conceptual way, this notion of one is more linear and structured and the other is more free-flowing and creative and all of this work is like right in between those yeah. two spaces and so it's just easier to fall on one side or the other and be super linear about it and lose the spark or super sparked and lose the structure like that that feels so normal and so I think um, distractions get in the way of being able to walk in between those spaces. Sorry, Sean. A lot of it for me is, again, that, that you know, autism, ADHD, PTSD, anxiety, etc. you know, finding, finding the, the, the brain hacks, because I think probably a number of you in the audience, and certainly a number of us up here, your, your brain does not have enough dopamine to operate. Is, is you know so finding ways to get more you know more of the brain juice to operate for some of us that's using the proper medication um, there are you know there are, uh, not just to lay it out there um, gabapentin has absolutely changed my life it has helped me with some of my pain issues it reduces my anxiety and when I and it helps me sleep because I also have insomnia so when I want to do creative work I, you know, I have two or three days where I can take gabapentin and then it stops working and I have to go off of it and I have to have a cranky couple of days and I will take the cranky couple of days of not getting anything done so that I have the days where I can get into the flow because the pain is reduced and the anxiety is reduced. Oh, the lights are reduced as well. Now be creative! Do it! That's, that's the secret to be creative. Right. Turn the lights on. Don't all gone. Like, oh, all right. I was like, uh, you know, and actually, this, you've been holding your hand up for a while, sorry. So first of all, Daniel, thank you for the idea of the creativity stallion. I'm going to go home and ride my creativity stallion. <laughs> but my question is, um, I have a lot of ideas, like tons and tons of them, and I, I'm great at planning out the art, the general arc of the book, and feeling all of that excitement. And then I get stuck on making decisions about the exact things that happen in the book. Because like I don't want to ruin my wonderful idea and I just I don't know which way to go. What do you do in that situation? 
you hurt your characters. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I, I find that I get precious about the world I'm building, and then I don't want to actually make changes to it because I don't want to uh, disrupt this sort of... I, I, I become too fond of my characters, so I don't want to hurt them, I don't want to kill them, I don't want to change their lives, I don't want to drag them through the mud. Um, but giving yourself permission, not even necessarily permission, but um, knowing that you need to do that is the thing that actually makes the work happen. Uh, remember, if you break it, you can make a new one. <laughs> you did it the first time already, so. Sometimes I just write a paragraph that says, scene with epic sword and light coming down from the heavens and a thing with some stuff. <laughs> and I'll write it later when I find the right song to uh -huh. do yeah. the thing. Um, as a screenwriter, I've been doing note cards a lot, and so I'll, I'll wrote, write on a note card what the scene is, what the characters are, what's happening in that scene, and then I'll move it around, I'll change things, I'll add a little notes on it about what's supposed to happen in that scene. Um, and I'll basically just keep doing that until I have the entire story figured out. Um, and you can figure out on each card what's supposed to change for them. And I find that that is a thing that moves me forward. And if nothing is changing for them, or the audience isn't learning anything new on that card, get rid of it. It doesn't serve you. You write one line, and then you recover. <laughs> That's writing. Yeah. Uh, Peyton. Uh, back on the question of why is creativity easily distracted, when you're doing something like writing, not all of the creativity is all of the fun. Like, there's one part where you're brainstorming and then you're moving to something where you're like, now I have to structure it, now my brain has to work more. And my brain is just like, no, 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 we want to do the fun creativity. We want to go and do something fun now. I'm like, okay, but we have to work at trying to make the scene make sense. That doesn't seem really fun. I'm going to be distracted and do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like creativity, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, it's a pipeline uh, with, the, it's like three different people, basically. Like, the fun part you're talking about is that one person who's just like, what if a horse had a gun on its head? You know, like, <laughs> like, woo, you know, like, we're having fun with it. Um, but then that last part you're talking about is the logician who's like, let me put all this through like a logical filter and actually see if it stands the smell test, you know, that actually like works together. And so I find that like when people falter with creativity, there's like some part of the pipeline that they struggle with, and that's the part that you have to like train and get better at. Yeah, or um, ask for help with, you know, right. find find a writing partner who will get you through that, or find a dramaturg or a director or someone who can help you with the, getting the structure into place. Like that's that's always a possibility too. Outsourcing can can be helpful. Yeah, Helen. Yeah, um, yeah. This is really great. Um, can you recommend uh, some books or some websites on creativity? The, writers. The question was, can we recommend some books or websites for creativity on writing to, to yeah. write for writers specifically? Yeah. Um, there are, God, there are so many books. It's so industry specific, you know, for me, um, uh, Save the Cat is a really useful screenwriting book that I hate, um, <laughs> but its advice is solid. I just really hate it. Um, Save the Cat is the name of it. It outlines some really useful things about the structure of narrative that actually applies very broadly, but it is very prescriptive. So um, I think knowing what's useful and knowing what's not is helpful. Um, there's a playwright, my favorite playwriting book is actually a book called Playwrights Teach Playwriting, which is interviews, Playwrights Teach Playwriting, which is interviews with different heads of MFA programs, and they're what, just what is your syllabus? What's your breakdown? What do you teach people? And so they basically just outline all of their creative exercises that they give to people. It's great. Sorry, if I can just interrupt, there's also, someone wrote a version of Save the Cat called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. So it takes, oh, the same, right. it takes the same premise, but applies it to novel writing. Great. Uh, if I and I hate it too. <laughs> <laughs> if I may uh, do a little bit of a plug, I uh, run a website called PromptSpinner.com, which is a way for it's 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 still a bit of a work in progress, but it's uh, a, an app for basically generating creative prompts to get started with. 
So you can generate prompts for uh, creating a new nation or creating a new world to write a story in or different characters or whatever. Um, so you know, we talked a little bit about prompts being a way to kind of start without a blank page. So this is a way to kind of like, at the very least, create a, a, a prompt for yourself to, to exercise with. Like I believe that like, you know, uh, divergent thinking is a, is a muscle that can be exercised like anything else. And so this is a way to sort of like spin it and see, you know, what you get and see what you can come up with based on the initial prompt. This is probably the only easy part of creativity, but each individual industry has specific rules that are easy to learn. Mm -hmm. So creativity is one tool, but the difference between screenwriting and radio script writing is trivial and you can learn it in 20 minutes. So whatever field you're in, go learn that. You're already ahead, now go back to creativity. Well, as an actor, I uh, have a book that really, I don't have a book, but I read a book. That, I'm sorry, like all of a sudden I'm gonna be like, yeah, I'm a, I have a book, you guys, no. Um, there's a book I read that is just amazing and I just can't remember the dang name of it, so I'm trying to look it up, but if I think of it, I'll let you guys know that I think is, is just, if you're trying to do any sort of acting, it's small, it's like literally maybe 100 pages at most, and it's just so direct about everything you need to do to do good scene work, be present, and be like good for acting. But I'm going to try to find it, and if I can, I will share it with you guys if I can remember, but it's just solid. Is it Elements of Style? No. It's, it's something yeah, with That's funny to like four of us, that's so sad. <laughs> so, anyway. so there's an author, he's, in, he's, he's a Hungarian-American psychologist, and he really wanted to geek out on creativity. He's got dozens of books on the topic. Uh, I'm gonna have to spell his name. It's Mihaly Chixin Mihaly. Um, if you start typing in his name into Google, the rest of it will come up. So the first name is, is M-I-H-A-L-Y. And then if you start typing into Google, it's C-S-I-K-S-Z-E-N-T-M-I-H-A-L-Y-I. What did that? Wow. Um, what a name. So that was my last password. Great. <laughs> Good password. Um, when I was doing, I was doing web design, software design, graphic design back in the dot com boom days, and I was just obsessed with trying to understand the process of creativity and innovation. Read all sorts of stuff, and his book made a lot of sense to me. What I will say is that I don't know that he really gets into what I what I now understand about neurodivergence and how that impacts the creative process. I'm looking at writing a book that takes that stuff that he's writing about and blends it with what I understand about my own neurodivergence to see if that can help people. Uh, but that's, you know, it's been on the back burner because running my art business is a little consuming. But yeah, his, his book has helped me. It's the creative flow, I think oh, it's... Flow. Flow, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but not from progressive. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is, a, you raise a really good point here, which is to find the style that works for your brain. Don't beat yourself up if you're trying to fit the style of someone else, you know? You read about um, Thomas Mann, who could just go into his office and sit for eight hours a day and write, and uh, my brain doesn't do that. Like, it just doesn't. Um, and so as much as I want to be that person who writes every day, um, that's not the way I'm wired. The way I'm wired is to write extensively for like three weeks and then not write for two months and then write extensively for another four weeks and then not write for, you know, a, a period of time. And I think some of that's the field I'm in, um, you know, as a theater artist and a filmmaker, you have to spend half your time just dealing with other people and getting your vision realized. You can't be writing all the time. Um, so that, that advice falls short on me and always has fallen fallen short on me, but that doesn't mean I'm not doing the thing, right? So I think find a way that works for you, your brain, your creativity. Take the advice of others with a grain of salt always. Um, Orange was in the back there. Wait, yeah. real quick, well, I found the book. But is well, anybody here that. actually like an actor pursuing acting at all? Okay, because otherwise I'm like, what am I doing this for? Um, okay, for what one person raised their hand, I appreciate you. The rest of you, okay, you're writers. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's called A Practical, Practical Handbook for the Actor by a bunch of people. There's too many in the name, but if you write that, if you just type that name, you'll get a practical handbook for the actor. I found it to be very helpful. It's dated, it's definitely an older book. It's got some weird references, but this concept and structure is very good. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Orange. Um, a couple things. One is I found some interesting books that were recommended to me. One is called The War of Art, 
Mm -hmm. oh, and the that. other one is strange enough written by um, a horror novel, Stephen King. Oh, Stephen already? King. Yeah, he has one. Oh, yeah. He has a, and there are exercises in it. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, also, I found that I have trouble like you do, where I can't write sometimes for days and days and days, and then other times I can't stop writing. I've discovered that liminal spaces, like just before you drop off or in the middle of the night, you'll get up and you'll sit at your computer and frantically start typing. That seemed to work really well. There was, a, there was an artist in the, um, a surrealist in the uh, turn of the last century who would uh, fall asleep holding a spoon over a chafing dish. Mm -hmm. He would try to try to do this until it fell, and it would wake him up, and he would just start writing everything he could remember about that space. <laughs> See, this is my brain. I'm like, where do I get a chafing dish? <laughs> That's the takeaway. Amazon, I'm sure. Pink. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I guess like across like all the fields, what um, in terms of like crossing the threshold into operating as a business or like mm -hmm. trying to come up with a timeline, what's something, whether like tax software or anything like that, <laughs> that you would have liked to have known um, crossing the threshold from amateur to professional? Get a tax person. <laughs> yes. Just, Learn. just straight up get a tax person. Learn marketing. Can I add to that? There is, in the Twin Cities, there is a nonprofit called Prepare and Prosper that does small business What was it called? For free. Prepare and Prosper. Prepare and Prosper. Prepare and Prosper. Prepare and Prosper. They're in St. Paul of University Avenue, but make, may have to make an appointment. Great. Um, I mean, our other artist resources, if you live in the Twin Cities, Springboard for the Arts it gives consultations with people, and they're happy to talk with you about how to make career moves that are useful to you. They work with all kinds of artists, so they're great. Um, I think, you know, marketing, you raise a very good point about that. Um, knowing that creative, the creative work is only part of the work, yeah. right? It, the, this notion, I think, that exists in the past or used to exist that artists only had to be artists just hasn't been true for the last 20 years at least um, probably more like the last 30 or 40 um, and especially now we live in such a place of self-publishing as a possibility in a way it never used to be self-promotion connections um, opening doors uh, panels like this one um, conventions I mean we, we kind of have to be prepared to be the public face of our work as well as um, the generators and creators of work. Um, I just think have all your stuff together. Um, the minute you, that sounds wrong. I'm going to say it in a better way. Um, just have it all ready, you know. Okay. Um, I will say that well, the best, best thing that I learned is, yeah, be, between becoming just like, I want to be this creative person to being like, I am a creative person, this is my job, people take me seriously. Have all those. Uh, um, it's the socials, the websites, just have all that stuff organized and together and professional um, if, you, if you choose to have those things. Uh, I have all the socials because of what I do, so all of them are the same name. Um, I make sure that I share my content, all of them, and then I have a website. That, you know, you, people can, you can leave, link people to, to to make sure they see that, those things because you just don't want to have any weird loose ends so that if someone does come to you or maybe, you know, a higher up of some sort who's kind of recruiting you can see that, yes, this person is really presenting themselves as a real business, not just someone who likes to do this for fun. Um, so I would say just, that's my best advice for that. Yeah. I, I started, um, well, so it, I, it was a long, slow path before it was even worth claiming any of the income on my taxes. Right. Um, I was, so I started out with, you know, after kind of, you know, crashing and burning, you know, the dot-com crash, I got a good, I got a good severance package and I decided, okay, I'm not going to just jump back into work. And I ended up divorcing my husband, moving to a pagan retreat center in the Ozarks, <laughs> um, learning leadership and facilitation skills. So I went from someone who, you know, I'm sure there's some of you out in the audience thinking, oh gosh, you know, how do I market myself? Like, how do I, I could never do a panel, I could never be the person up there. You can. Yeah. I now teach public speaking. That's I was cool. the terrified person. Cool. You can learn to do it. And so I did, I learned to do it. I started presenting at pagan festivals for free, you know, on my own dime. Yeah. And I built a reputation as a teacher. I started writing blog posts. I got my, you know, my socials together. I started being invited as a guest presenter. And then when I had my first books come out, my art started selling. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, they have nothing to do with each other, really. 
you, it's just that I'm an author, I'm a guest presenter, and now my art started selling. And then I made the jump to vending at uh, you know, geeky events like this because you, at a, as a guest of honor at a pagan festival, I might have made a grand in a week selling art and books, and you know I get a modest travel stipend, and that's a week of my life. Uh, I make vastly more than that vending at a geeky event. So, you know, I had to kind of give up my dream of making a living as a pagan teacher. Uh, if you're involved in all the pagan community, it, it, that's really very difficult to do. Um, so, you know, but I, it was a long time before I even bothered claiming any of the income on my taxes because it was, you know, I was operating in cash. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to say, oh, you know, do things. I bet any. I think technically, um, if you're making less than a certain amount, yeah. you really don't even have to file taxes. Um, so, I, you know, when I started making after a certain threshold, then I started, you know, actually doing the financial stuff. I'm terrible at the financial stuff. I really do need a tax person. I'm at that level where I need to switch it's over. So good. Yeah, yeah. Those oh, taxes are wild. Really. I don't even know what they are. I just go take care of it, and I'm like, I'm happy to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> um. So, it's in my it's in my brain. I'm just trying to organize it so it will come out of my mouth. Okay. <laughs> so, like, when this is going back, like, I don't know, 20 minutes at this point, but like, the hyper focus creativity. That's just that's wonderful. That's fantastic. But like. Getting over that hump when hyper focus turns into hyper no is, <laughs> is like anything that would help with that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what you mean. What do you mean hyper focus to hyper no? Like ADHD paralysis where you sit there and can't do anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, oh. like when your brain goes know, sorry. from hyper focused on this thing right. to I literally cannot focus on this thing. I see. See. I personally, I I would do like Mateo said. I just take a walk, leave, move around, away. That's I guess that's the only thing I would say. For me. Yeah, I think it's like your brain's natural way of saying you need to do something else right now, and you don't have to feel like um, it's not productive. Like like you know when I I've talked a few times about inputs, right? You can go and you know do something that kind of expands your understanding of the current world. That isn't necessarily explicitly has an output yet, but you can still like utilize that time to like go, you know, experience something, or just even go for a walk, and and it, and it is constructive in its own way, even though it might not feel like it. I do an easy dopamine thing um, sometimes. So do you do you all know that the trick of you write something on your to do list that you've already done and you cross it off? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Or like you know if I if I if I'm in that you know that executive function paralysis thing, I'll you know I'll go I'll go do something easy and I, you know it's, sometimes it's even hard to make myself do that. But I'll go okay I'll do I'll do one easy thing and try and get the, the juice going. And I mean, I might not be able to get back into hyper-focus land, but I can at least get other BS done that's on my to-do list. So um, I usually have about eight projects that are unfinished at a given time, if not upwards of 30. Um, uh, so you can always use um, the element of procrastination to motivate you to do another thing. So if you're not feeling it, you can't do any more on this one thing, move on to this other thing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, now's a good time for me to check my email. Now's a good time for me to build that web page that I've been meaning to build. Now's a good time for me to do something else that can stay in the, I would say, try to stay somewhere in the realm of adjacency to that creative process. Don't like get up, abandon it, and do the dishes, but maybe do something that, um, you know, if, if you can't anymore with the work of writing um, the creative work of scenes or story structure or um, chapters, maybe do the layout, maybe do, like you were saying, the edge of the thing. Do, do something that is not asking anything of your creative brain, but is still a necessary part of the creative process. Yeah. One last thing to jump off that. This might answer your question, maybe not, but I don't know about you guys, but I need deadlines. They help me a lot, they motivate me. It can stress you out, but if you have something due and you know when it's due, you're gonna kick yourself into high gear and get that thing done. Hopefully it's good, but if it's not, you'll learn maybe that you need more time or something like that. 
but if you don't have a deadline, usually it can just endlessly, endlessly go for things that are obviously deadlineable. Not you know, if you're writing a book on your own, you got to give yourself those deadlines or something like that. Find a way to be like hold yourself accountable. Yeah, I think deadlines are really helpful. I have a hard time with them unless they are very, very meaningful. So like. I go to rehearsal and I don't have a script for the first day of rehearsal, that, that's going to feel bad for everyone involved. So um, you need to have, have those elements in place. But like, if I'm doing a solo project, um, God, I have so many videos that I have almost finished. <laughs> almost finished and there's no attached deadline. And even if there is, if it's self-imposed, it's not going to be, it, I know that's artificial. And my brain knows it's artificial too. I, I have the same problem. Yeah. One thing that uh, has worked for me is I have this like, uh, it's kind of like a commonplace book where basically it's, I use it as a habit making tool. So basically uh, the way that it works is I have, you know, habits I want to, you know, incentivize myself to begin doing, you know, like a habit like, you know, write one page or, you know, whatever. It's, it's hard to you know, you have, to, you have to be smart about what habits you want to create. But the idea is, you know, um, I, uh, I, I, I score how I perform, and then I actually have this sort of like, uh, like series of things that I reward myself with if I, if I do it well enough. So it's kind of like, you know, like, uh, it's like, oh, I'll go, you know, I, I did all my things this week, so I'll go buy myself a pack of Magic the Gathering cards or something like that, right? Um, and so creating this little reward system for yourself kind of creates in my life this sense of consistency where it's like uh, having deadlines work if they're meaningful, but otherwise it's like I can kind of predictably say like, okay, you know, I've developed this habit and I'm doing this X times a week and whatever. And so I can probably say I'm going to, you know, get somewhere at some point. But um, I found it to be more effective for me when I can't really fool myself into following arbitrary deadlines. So I think we have time for one more. Um... Oh, and of course, everyone puts their hands up. We're going to call on someone who has to ask a question before reading here. Uh, so you talked a bit about how to trick your brain into working for creativity. What if your body is being uncooperative, chronic pain, illness, and so on? How do you treat your body well to be able to be creative? I can, I can, I can, I can, I can speak down. to it. Well, so some days are just not going to be a good day. And, um, so with fatigue, like, okay, so tonight, I, you know, at, at about 4 p.m., I start taking down my booth. That takes about four hours, and I am pretty much a physical wreck by the end of, of you know, because I have hypermobility, so my backs and my hips are going to just nope for the next couple of days. If I try to push myself to do things, like, you know, we drive home on Monday, and tomorrow, if I try to push myself to do things tomorrow night or Tuesday, that's just my brain and my body are just going to nope out. So I need to give myself enough rest to recover from venting. Um, you know, I, I have two weeks before my next event, so it, it, you know, there's there's the there's the balance of I have the push of the deadline, but I also need to make sure you know that, that I'm not um, trying you know trying to do things when I'm really in pain is just it's just and, and fatigued. It's not going to work. Now, what I do over the course of the week is when I start having a little energy, I go ahead and do stuff, and then if I hit the fatigue wall, I go to bed. Because I know there's no pushing past the fatigue wall. My brain is just not gonna, gonna handle it. My back is just gonna say, no, this. Um, my partner is a massage therapist. We're dealing with folks with chronic pain, so they keep me functional. Um, they, we are, we're moving to town, and uh, I have their business cards, so uh, we're going to be opening a practice here. So sometimes, you know, the, 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 there are solutions for the pain. Um, things like, you know, the medication I mentioned, gabapentin, works for me, doesn't work for everybody. Um, massage, things like that. Like, there are there are management things for it, but it's, it's you know, it, there are days when it's just not going to work. And I still have the whole anxiety voice beating me up for not being able to push past it, and I have to just say, shut up, I need to sleep. Yeah, I, because I can't push through it. I, I, I'd say that, like, yeah, if you can't, like, 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 another reason why I don't like deadlines, because you can't predict, like, what your body is going to be like, I'm tired. Um, I think, like, a lot of people talk about time and task management, but energy management is another very important thing. Um, and it's why, like, you know, like, if I don't have to be expending lots of energy, I won't. Mm -hmm. And also, I, if you can, I, I find, I found that, like, you know, actually making sure that I, you know, um, you know, I, I'm fairly into fitness and I do a lot of it, and that 
it improves my energy, which improves my creative output. So like, and not everyone you know has the, the 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 physical capability to be consistently active, but if you can, I think that also is another tool in your toolbox that you can use. I second that. Yeah. That works for me too. Um, I don't I don't deal with chronic pain issues, but I do. I mean, I do. We all, I think, to some degree, um, have things in our life that are pressing on us in terms of time and energy that are unavoidable. Like, I own a house, right? And um, there is work that just needs to be done around the house, right? The, these are necessary things. I don't have domestic servants. I don't imagine many of you do. We, we are not Victorians who are living a life where so many of our needs are taken care of us and outsourced to other people. We have technology to help us with a lot of those things. So I think that the degree to which we are capable of outsourcing elements of our life to others. Um, if, if laundry is a thing and you have the funds, don't be afraid to like get a service for it. If, um, if housekeeping is a problem for you and you can get someone to help you with it, get someone to help you with it. You know, like the, Make more room in your life for the things that you want to be doing. If those aren't options for you, that's fine. But recognize then that those are things that still need to happen and don't feel bad about it, right? Yeah, you know, your first tool Every, all of us share this in common. Your first tool is your brain and your body. And you must serve that and you must take care of that, regardless of what field you're in. So understand that will involve life changes too. I mean, I will not go to a dance teacher who smokes because they're lying to me. You have to think about these things. Is this good for me? Is it good for my creativity, my lifestyle? Whatever it is I want to achieve. And those are costs we pay and benefits we get. And on that note, have a great convention. Enjoy your Sunday.